Hi everyone, I'm Ian Fales from Befores and Afters and welcome to this special webinar, Beyond Sand and Spice, the VFX of June. Joining me today, and I'm just gonna run through everyone in one go here, we've got overall VFX suit, Paul Lambert, Dean Egg VFX executive producer, Janet Hale, Dean Egg VFX supervisors, Tristan Miles and Brian Connor, and Dean Egg animation director, Robin Lockham. Welcome everyone, it's great to see you all. Um, hey, yeah. For those. Hi. <laughs> For those of you who are new to DNEG's deep dive webinar series, these webinars were created to spotlight DNEG's remarkable talent and to dive deep <laughs> into their specialties and passions. These live sessions are open to anyone who loves visual effects and animation and wants the opportunity to learn more and engage with DNEG's team. Now, I want to mention that if you've got a question during this webinar, please pop it into the Q&A section here in Zoom. And also what I'd also love to see is um, people in the chat say where they're from. It might be London, Vancouver, Sydney, um, which is where I am at the moment. Please let us know where you're tuning in from. That would be really cool. We're gonna get straight into it um, because there's a lot to cover. Whoa, there's people from all over the world here I can see already, which <laughs> is fantastic. Yeah, crazy, man. <laughs> awesome. it's it's every that. point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, but yes, we're going to get straight into it because there's so much to cover. Um, Janet, I'm actually going to start with you. It was such a huge show, of course. I thought I'd ask you about some of the big d stats and um, numbers coming out of June just to make this project happen. What, what were some of those big stats? Sure. Well, just to start off with a few numbers, uh, we had 1170 shots in the film, plus another 120 or so that didn't actually survive the cutting room process. So always sad to see those go. We had 800 crew in our credits on the show, but in fact, there were easily another two or 300 who touched on it at various points and didn't actually make it into the credits. Um, I did a little calculation this morning just to see what that came to. That was 300 artist years of work, which when you look at it like oh that, is a huge, huge number. Wow. Some very large teams on there. We had uh, nearly 130 <laughs> compositors. The next largest department was 84 effects TDs, which anyone who's worked in visual effects, effects departments will know that's a significant percentage of the effects TDs on the planet, I think. So uh, a <laughs> lot of numbers in there. Um, we had some huge builds. The Arakeen City was about 15% of our total time. There'll be a lot more touched on that later in this uh, this webinar, I'm sure, some very, very big explosion shots. The Paul Vision sequence was huge, and I know we're going to talk about that. One thing that surprised me when I was just checking out the render numbers um, as we were preparing for this is it's not always the big high drama, high explosion shots that, uh, that have the biggest impact on render. The, um, the very quiet and reflective desert mouse shots after Paul and Jessica are stranded in the desert were actually our biggest, longest renders. They were huge, well over a day per frame for the close-ups on those. Wow. Which is uh, an interesting and reflective little moment for compared with all the, uh, the huge things that we had. Wanted That's to get amazing. that in there because the poor little mouse isn't going to get much attention oh, in the rest of the webinar. <laughs> Robin remembers that well. He spent a lot oh, of time. Oh, I love Little Marity. He's, he's great. I love his metaphor. He's good. He's good. It was four K and sometimes eight K renders, if I remember for that for the for the fur definition. Yeah, yeah. Fur very and macro the, shots. The water running uh, down. Was, uh, it was, uh, yeah, yeah. Massive. It's like everything in one hit, wasn't it? Fur, muscle, water, sand, wind, mm. rain, lightning. <laughs> <laughs> Don't remember the lightning, but maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. I think yeah I think most of our, our bigger areas we can touch on uh, as we go ahead there are some uh, some quite impressive numbers especially in the Paul vision but uh, numbers aren't necessarily what everybody's here for oh well great Janet yes I'd love to come back to some of those other areas as we keep chatting um, but I guess we're gonna jump into sand screens now I, I feel like there's been so much discussion of those um, you know, during the coverage of VFX of June. Um, Paul, maybe starting with you, do you want to give a brief overview of why sand screens became part of this show at all? Well, like, basically, like, uh, we wanted to come up with uh, techniques which would help us uh, 
uh, provide the best basis for uh, for uh, visual effects. You know, like um, rather than rather than just trying to shoot something up uh, up against a blue or a green screen, like we wanted to come up with a with a way which would which would actually help us in the in the uh, final final composite. And you know, we took the path of of uh, using using different colors uh, for the different worlds. Like for example, we used you know for Caladan we used gray, and for for Arrakis uh, we actually used a sand color. But there was a, there was a multitude of reasons for it. You know, like um, if we could just quickly jump to to uh, number seven, please, Gemma. So when you actually look at this particular shot, you can actually see that there is a sand screen in the final shot. And this isn't a visual effect shot. This is actually the sand screen and the sky because I knew that there were gonna be um, uh, visors and things which were gonna be uh, reflective. And, you know, um, having having those, those like small little things appear in the shots when they're not really down for visual effects. Like if I had done this as a blue screen, then like, you know, it would have become a visual effect shot. Yes, it could have been done in the DI, but like it, it it still would have had to be processed. Um, can you jump to uh, number four, please? So here, and also for for the interactive light. So um, as you can see on on uh, Leto and on his face and on his suit, like we're actually getting a uh, reflection of the of the uh, sand screen on him. The idea being that like they are looking out into the open desert so that um, uh, so that you want to convey that like this bright hot brown light is actually uh, coming coming into the scene and what we found with this particular idea what that was that like if we inverted this uh, if we inverted the uh, sand colored uh, screen we we got a blue screen and you know yes there are keys which which you can use and pick any color, but like I'm actually the author of IBK, and like the way in which I understand it, it it's either got to be a green or a blue color. So that's kind of what drove that that uh, that uh, particular approach. Now, don't get me wrong, there are plenty of shots which uh, required a, a bunch of roto, and like we had sand blowing. Um, if you play uh, number three, please, again. Gemma. So like we had plenty of sand blown and that kind of thing. And, you know, it was great. It's a great credit to, uh, to the uh, compositors, like to actually be able to blend, blend, uh, blend this work. And um, yeah, like it, just if, if you want to jump in with uh, some of the processes. Uh, yeah, so it was a uh, image based keying, as you uh, sort of mentioned before, there is obviously some roto required at times. I don't think you can get away from that. Uh, I think the thing with the sound screens, the questions I get the most is, is it a magic bullet to suddenly getting a better key? And it's it's not. You, you've got to talk to any of the compositors that worked on this. It's similar to doing a normal key as you would with a blue screen, green screen. But the benefit is <clears throat> there's much less, uh, even none, uh, relighting of the scene because you've got that correct light, uh, that luminance and hue uh, bouncing back onto the characters. And that's great as well for when you're blending, blending edges. I saw someone in the chat, uh, I think worked on June, mentioning that it was great for edges. And, and it was. Edges of characters, hair detail, cloth detail, uh, all those sorts of things that you sometimes have to struggle with uh, on a traditional um, key, let's say, were much easier to come by in this. I use the word easy relatively because there's still a lot of work uh, compositing-wise to, to get it to sit in there. but. Um, it, it definitely helped. You, you don't really get any of those shots where you have a, you feel that the character is separate from the background, and I think that's largely due to the the sand screen spill, if you were, which works for yeah, the scene. Yeah, because there was not a there was no blue to uh, remove, and you know different keyers and different artists remove or suppress the blue in different ways. So therefore, that's why you kind of get things that are a bit all over the place and. And so that's one thing that you don't have to do with, with this technique. The other thing I, I noticed is we didn't, you know, we have these 40 buys on set and, you know, Tristan, I'm sure you can uh, jump in as well, but like 
when when something is the a sand color or an earth tone, I don't, you kind of it kind of just sinks into the background as one would hope, and it's not it's less distracting to the crew. It's less distracting, I would argue, to the cast, the actors. You know, looking at something that isn't that's just a sand color or acting in front of it, I feel like it's just a bit less distracting than normal. So um, I think that kind of comes across in, in terms of, you know, potentially the performances and then just the overall attitude on set was, if I asked to move a 45, they're like, yeah, yeah, hurry up. But it wasn't, what it was less, there was less uh, um, uh, um, resistance kind of to having them kind of up close and personal when we needed them. Yeah, because basically like uh, it was treated as part of the set, you know, like, uh, you know, it, you know, it could be seen as as part of a wall of Arakeen or but not in every every case, but that's that's kind of what we tried to do is, is you know, to to like have it as 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 part part of the set, you know, so. One thing that I think a few of my friends and readers have always asked about sand screens is, did it mean there was no roto? And I'm I'm assuming, of course, say Brian and Tristan, of course that's not true. Roto comes into play here, of course. You don't just push a button and make it happen. Um, but you've kind of talked about how it aided things on set and later on. But could you just mention a little bit about the rotoscoping side of this as well, Brian and Tristan? <laughs> It fixes all, even with IPK node in Nuke. There's, there's still, still a lot of uh, fiddling to do. Yeah, like I think you always shot, need to use. Every yeah. shot has 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 a piece of roto, regardless mm. of of what the color. Yeah, yeah, for the there's core there's... especially, you know, uh, obviously when you have the kind of beige or, or colored clothing uh, against a, a sand screen of a similar tone, um, you know, you have to. You have to extract it as you would nor any any other difficult key blue jeans on blue screen, for example, but it's totally doable, you know, using the different color registers or channels and Luma keys and, and whatnot to get the edges. And then you have the core that's that's roto um, a, as a foundation. They work, they work really well. Yeah. And also one thing to uh, remember as well is that Brian and Tristan and myself all come from compositing. So like uh, at one point we were comp super, <laughs> we weren't comp supervisors. So, you know, it's, a, it's, it's quite a process to, to like try and get a final image through the, the, through the, through the pipeline, because like, you know, having come through that path, we're all fully aware of what's the real edge and, 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 and what isn't. And if anything, like, you know, the, the like challenge of this work was that like you would have to come up with a different technique rather than rather than the techniques which you may have learned previously like it was a, it, it's a brand new challenge to like try and take this kind of coloring and trying to you know like i always see the keen process not as a as a uh, as an extraction per se but more of a blend more of a image transfer you know uh, from one background to another so you know i think i think you know as a compositor you look at it in a slightly different way yes you get a bunch of roto to actually help you but then after that you have to come up with the different techniques to actually blend that together and i think having that additional oversight helps push the uh helps push the comp to uh to uh to a more mm. refined level um, actually, Gareth Owen in the Q&A, thanks so much, Gareth, for this question, has asked whether you guys were tempted to use AI roto at all, perhaps for final roto, but, you know, whether also it might have just been used for temp comps. Did any of that machine learning techniques come in at all for a roto? It's funny because I did actually, well, uh, I did actually play with uh, that idea early on, and this was in... This was in pre-shooting, but, but like at that time, because this was what, like nine, uh, this was back in 19. So like things were still quite slow. It's a, it's a different thing now, but like uh, back then things are still quite slow to get, to get like a segmentation uh, and, and, and that kind of thing. So, but, but yes, things are, things are very different now. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, you, you may see 
a whole bunch of new techniques coming up in in uh, in the future films based on based on that uh, particular process. Right. Well, let's move on to ornithopters um, because, as I say, we've got so much um, to talk about. And please keep your questions coming through, Robin. Turning to you with ornithopters, I'm really interested about reference here. Um, things like helicopters, dragonflies, and whatnot. What did you look to for proper reference for these amazing um, vehicles? Thanks, Ian. It was it was it was tricky um, because nothing <laughs> of this size existed. So when we were looking at it originally at the start, you know, we looked at every kind of helicopter around and and ship. And, but the biggest attack helicopter we found was a black hawk, but that it would fit inside an ornithopter. It was so big. So we started going, okay, how let's look at the size and weight of this. And I knew from you know previous films that this is an important issue for Denis to make sure this has quality and weight. So we started mucking around with Tristan and like throwing him on some uh, some shots of black hawks, you know, that we comped in together just to see the scale. And we saw it's massive, it's huge. Um, and the wingspan alone is you know the size of a small, like medium to small aircraft. So at the start, it was all about, okay, that's, that's how, how do we resolve the size of it? Then we moved in of like, how do we actually get that size in the air? So it was, it was going through this process of, okay, it's got these wings, they obviously beat, but what could cause enough downforce to lift this fuselage? So I really went into that kind of deep dive into that military idea of like in the engineering side, because that's what the whole film was about. It had to be real. It was definitely science fiction, but it couldn't be science fiction fantasy, so to speak, as much as science fiction reality, which is a kind of what we're looking at. So we went into this wing beats. We saw the, the, the skinniness of the wings needed to cause a lot more movement to actually push it in the air. We went for a lot of areas of, you know, how mechanical could it be? Um, you know, how, how much performance could it be there? But really, when we started speeding it up and speeding it up and we started looking at other different references, kind of just worked really really well it's like, like you know you wouldn't expect a big object which has wings to have to look at the small creature you would look at a mm. bigger wing an albatross you'd look larger wings could create more downforce the wings were very thin so you just couldn't create that logical downforce so really the the faster you sped up and faster you sped up and you went really really fast and it still didn't quite work suddenly we went kind of supersonic you know, you wouldn't expect a very, very large machine to travel that fast. It just, it's just started to work. You know, the references we had and the concepts we had from Patrice were incredible. Um, we always look at, you know, creatures. And I think Paul said to me at one point, Denis was out in the desert and seeing creatures around that were slightly influential. So we tried to pluck out a few moments of reference there to see. It was very, it's very military. So it's quite tricky. We went, we had the, the emblem of, of the Atreides is this, is this kind of big birds. We looked at those as well to see if that could do anything, but it, it was kind of not the right thing, but it was good to explore because it kind of shuts down the avenues of where you should be going. But yeah, once we started looking at um, hummingbirds and dragonfly, which is the opposite of the scale and the size of it, it just, it, it just made sense because what it did, it, it created this illusion of, oh, this could actually keep in the air. This, this amount of speed, could lift this fuselage so heavy in the air, which was a complete contrast to the size, but really, really worked. I think also we were fortunate this this blur um, didn't mean you focused on the wings themselves moving and the actual art articulation, which could look a bit wrong. It was just such a, a visible object that you're like, okay, this mass of blur is keeping this alive and keeping the air. Mm. So when we started testing it, we re I realized quickly that all the wings are quite individual. And I, was, I think I was playing with Tristan and Paul and we started splaying them a little bit and, and separate them more saying, oh, that could have more maneuverability. It just didn't really work. It, was, it would look too thin. So we had to keep them knitted visually together to kind of cause that. So as we were going through, we started looking more stuff and then we looked obviously at dragonflies amazingly. Dragonflies have their wings attached on the back rather than the middle, but you could see you know, the relationship, the, re the ratio of, of wing spread and, and, and blur compared to the size of the body was, was, was definitely going to work. And start, we started putting that on our animations and it, yeah, it just started singing. It's like, oh, this is great. And I was really proud because we'd solved it. And then we came up with like um, a movement Bible. 
So I remember saying to Paul, um, uh, let's try and work out every action that could possibly have and we'll send it over. Then you'll know, for me, I'm like, Denis could visualize and Paul could visualize what it should look like when it's doing a certain performance. And once you solve those angles and those kind of laws, you know safely when you go into shots, like, okay, this makes sense because we've worked it out. But it was great. I mean, it's great going through hummingbirds. It's great going through dragonflies. I think the most interesting stuff we had was when we kind of set this laws out, it was like, okay, well, we need to go deeper. It, was, it wasn't just the wing beats. It was like, okay, if I want to go this way, does the wing beat spread? Well, it does, but also the, 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 the rhythms inside the blur have to change as well to show that we can push more energy on that side, which shows it can roll a certain way. Then we started to get the good stuff, but that was really hard mm. to actually work out in animation because you've got such density of keys. So trying to get rhythms and scaling and moving those keys around, I was very, very tricky. So, right. But yeah, it, it kind of more from study, um, from the images, from like, okay, the engineering side, we did go into insects, but it was the engineering side. And then it, it kind of clicked. I think the biggest compliment we had was, you know, it, was, it just made sense. And it's almost like you didn't mm. question it so much. So I'm like, I mean, that's pretty good considering it's a giant buzzing <laughs> military vehicle. <laughs> that everyone just thinks, oh yeah, that, that's how it was supposed to be, right? Um, yeah. So I think that's just from R&D. R&D and, and really, really, really pushing. I mean, Paul, yeah. guys, they're not taking any prisoners and how detailed and how good it has to look. So we, we had to do exactly the same, and if not more, we had to, this had to be completely believable. And, and a few people have been asking in the chat, so I thought I may as well ask now about how you did achieve that motion blur on the ornithopter wings, which is so beautiful. Does someone want to jump in and talk about that, the technique you used there? Well, I mean, it's hard. It's a lot of rendering. <laughs> um, it, it, it was painfully, it was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, painfully. It's, I mean, it's real. It's, uh, there's maybe 11 sub steps per frame, um, mm. which are rendered out. Um, I mean, there's a bit of comp work actually just to tweak a little bit, but it's a lot of shader work, getting those beautiful pings of highlights, which look amazing in the shots. But they are real. They are, they are blades that go up and down that fast. They're maybe, they have a little bit of a figure eight, much like you get in a, a, a bird wing. Um, but they're absolutely rendered. So when we had shots of multiple, multiple ornithopters, you know, the rendering team was still go, okay, let's just see how we get on with this one. But it was real and it, it had to. I mean, Especially when there's a yeah. change. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, change the wings this way. But it's, it had to be real. I mean, we were, we're I, I'm, I'm not only changing the blur levels to, to motivate the movement, so I'm rotating the wing angle, which has to catch different light and have mm. different looks. So it's hard to cheat that really through, I mean, as, as marvelous as, as 2D is and comp is, it's really hard to cheat that in, in space, but you're rotating a whole ship around and changing the angle. It's some hard tricks to get that right. So it was done for real. Yeah, as real right. as well. And, and Paul, one of the awesome things as well as Dean Egg's CG ornithopters is how they mix in with the practical full built ornithopter and um, cockpit sections. Can you talk a bit about that crossover? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, uh, Patrice, uh, the uh, production designer, had uh, designed these uh, these amazing ornithopters and like uh, we built two 12-ton versions which, which we took out to Budapest and we also shipped one out to uh, Jordan. You know, the idea being was that like a uh, we would use these as set pieces. And, and we also lifted them up by cr with uh, cranes. The idea being to like try and replicate uh, when they land and take off. Now, obviously they didn't have wings. So on like some of the shots, uh, we added CG wings, but one thing which we were doing constantly was just blowing sand all the time to like, to like, uh, uh, to give the impression of like all this sand actually being being uh, disturbed for when the for when uh, the uh, when Dean Egg would put on put on the uh, CG wings, but you know like having having that particular thing on set was was uh, I think fundamental to to making all of the digital uh, ornithopters uh, 
real as well because like you know we had the perfect reference like mm -hmm. we had a a finished ornithop but you know a a nearly 100 percent finished ornithop on, on the set which was you know in the light and whenever like we had to do a shot where like we had to take it over in, in uh cg we had the perfect reference to to uh, be able to to uh, do a match now one other thing which we did with uh with the uh, two ornithopters is, is is that we try to use uh real helicopters as well uh for reference you know and like mm. we also use those for for taking off and landing but then also shooting um shooting from helicopter to helicopter and like the in this particular one you can see that like the only thing we did here was uh was a uh, swap out the uh swap out the ornithopter, but kept all the interactive, all the interactive sand as is. Now there were times when, like, we had to add some additional sand to it, but uh, but you know that was very much the the uh, philosophy. Like you know, the key to a fantastic visual effect is is like when you're able to copy something. So like having having more and more on set for the guys and girls to actually match to is the is is what I believe the. The key to a uh, successful visual effect. Now, yes, we have we have a multitude of shots which are all CG. But what you'll find is that they're always bookended with like something real from the set. You know, whether it's the first shot or you know, it's always intercut with uh, with uh, with, uh, with, uh, with something real, just so that like everything stays stays grounded. And that was the basic philosophy throughout the shoot to like try and get at least something in camera. You know, to so that like. Uh, so that uh, the uh, facilities could 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 have something to latch onto and to uh, to uh, copy. Mm. I think Paul, as well, the actual having the live action from from our guys is pretty good because it showed them the sheer weight. I mean, you couldn't swing this round on a crane. You just showed them the sheer weight. Yeah, of this it. it was twelve tons. Yeah, and everyone, especially, exactly, and everyone, especially Denis and you, was seeing that move. So. We couldn't get away with any kind of unrecognized lightweight work because it's you've seen it on set, and that was, yeah, great. Yeah. That was really good for us too as well. Mm. Yeah, look, I think I think getting getting the actual weight of, of these ornithopters was a was a really really successful. You know, it actually feels that that like these things can actually fly, which is which is beautiful. Yeah. Mm. Um, someone's asked a question here about that compositing um, of a rendered wing into a live action shot while it's being overlapped by the real sand blowing in the wind. Brian or Tristan, do you want to talk about some of the complexities there? Um, well, I think the, the, the very nature of the, the blowing sand itself lends itself to that. So it's, we had a, um, as you can see from the final film, a talented team of, uh, of effects artists that would try to match, certainly for shots that really needed it, try to match the speed and movement and, and density of the, the dust to the shot. And then there'd be a blend point partially across the uh, original plate of the, an ornithopter going out across into the wings to, to give, you that, give you that nice uh, uh, join between the two. Uh, and I think that's what it is. And just having a, having a careful eye uh, to balance it all together. Not straightforward, but then Where's the challenge if it's uh, if it's too easy? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and, and always, with that, I always prefer a harder con than an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> with with uh, I mean, there's artist. always a sorry. Uh, there's there's a when you have, when you have a continuous backing and you have you know you'll 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 have some separation from the with the foreground and it's probably brighter because of the sun. Uh, so there are ways to key that off of the sand screen as well. Uh, you know, a good compositor can absolutely do that and retain as much as possible to put it over the background ornithopters or whatever additions that we're, we're adding back there. And then, you know, as, as Kristen mentioned, um, we have great effects that have duplicated, you know, the, the performance uh, of it ex exactly. And then, of course, there's, uh, you know, generic elements and things that you can layer in there to get a very convincing composite. Awesome. A and Janet, not to put you on the spot here, but someone has asked about an average render time for one frame of an ornithopter shot. 
it's probably not something you have to hand. And I imagine it must vary depending on the sand and whether it's flying over Iraqis or it's whatnot. It's very, very varied, yeah. I mean, the yeah. um, effects passes bring in a different level of things entirely, but the uh, the basic ornithopters, um, they weren't some of our heaviest things from memory, Tristan, were they, as long as they weren't in a, a huge... I think it shows it you the quality of effects of sand and everything else mm. when a, a 11 substep multi piece mm. faceted <laughs> ornithopter is like... Yeah, oh, an ornithopter sitting on the ground, no effects, not bad at all. As soon as it's got uh, the, the blade motion blur and the uh, the sandstorm must have been fairly heavy going, I suspect, Brian, you probably know the numbers on that better than me. But uh, yeah, some of them, it, it, it's, there's a lot of variables in there. <laughs> Yeah, think not, not yeah. quick is, is, a, is a, a blanket answer. And I think <laughs> that if I remember rightly, it's proximity to the camera as well. The closer the camera it got, uh, the, the longer the render times, longer the render times got. Indeed. So, yeah. Something I just wanted to mention um, that I particularly enjoyed about the show is um, when you have reference of, and you have a real helicopter landing in front of the camera, uh, uh, and doing, you know, all the blade wash and everything that it would do. Um, sometimes it blows into the camera and you can't see anything like the shot, perfect timing, uh, <laughs> where, you, you know, it, 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 get, it gets obscured and because that's exactly what would happen. Now, you know, in some films, like the, 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 the director, they want to see the ornithopter. So we clear it out to taste, but in, in the case of Dune, Paul's uh, edict, I think, was pretty much like, if that's what should happen in the sim, uh, in this case, or, or if that's what we see in the reference in the upper left-hand corner, then that's what should happen. So I think that really adds to the, the believability of the composites and the shots in general. I think Absolutely. A lot of people have said they're their favorite shots. I've heard from so many people, you know, when I've said, what's your favorite shot in June? They'll pick one or another of the ornithopter shots. Everybody seems to absolutely love them. Yeah, it's because they want one, Janet. Yeah. And they want they know, one. My, fav my favorite <laughs> shot is the shot of the three ornithopters ap approaching Arakeen. I absolutely love oh, that yeah, shot. Yeah. It's so cool. It's, so cool. Well, it's, um, it's funny, those ornithopters, that giant 12 one, Paul's actually in it right now, just live. Just uh, take the hand with it. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder the what triple. that one is for, actually. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's move on to um, sandworms. I mean, they they were just incredible too, the way they move through the sand. And I think there's something here we want to talk about in terms of the sandworm itself, but and the way it also interacts with the sand. Robin, again, with sort of quickly looking at reference here, what, what were those main things you looked at for the sandworms? Yeah, sandworm was, a, was quite an interesting uh, journey. Um, again, much with the ornithopters, I would just dive into the absolute details of it. I went really, I mean, quite biological and really into, you know, how could this function and move through the sand? But the interesting journey was where we went biological, we went almost I went to, to biological really, and we kind of had to take a step back. So initially looking at things like earthworms, how they move and constantly through, look at snake muscles and how they push and pull themselves through. It was good and it was, you know, right. It just didn't kind of click with what the sandworm is and, and where it exists in its environment. So it was only after a few tests and going through with Paul and Denise saying, yeah, it's good, but it's not quite there yet. We had to look at it and it was, it was actually going through the effects and seeing effects and how we had to just do some simulations for effects and get those working how it kind of clicked so taking a further step back and a further step back with the anim team we were like okay well what is what is the salmon where does it exist you know and and quite quickly you saw these giant seas of sand and these huge crests of sand dunes and so with the effects we started to look at it from being more of this has a bit of grace you know has a bit of elegance going through it and has a bit of power going up and through and it became this this kind of almost sand whale effect when it was when it was in the ground and had a had a good logic to it because you know at that scale is that, that the sand would move a little bit like water because it's moving so much and it 
has a kind of an epic master that we as an audience connect with, like a blue whale, seeing that in the sea, how it's just phenomenal and terrifying, you know, so you respect it. So once we got through this kind of process of the, the broad structure of movement, it really, really worked. And I, I was fortunate to know a bit about whales from a past show and, and I, I really started enjoying it. And I was like, yeah, there we go. And that adds that kind of majesty, I guess, which if you had a bit of an organic one moving around, it wouldn't work so much. Um, so it was a great journey. It was a great journey just getting into the biology. I mean, we went very deep into that, obviously, and started stripping it down. You know, I'd sit there with that and okay, and my pencil and paper. It's like, well, how, how would this exist? You know, what would I, how could I Frankenstein something together to make this exist? And obviously nothing does. And I went, found some old historical pictures of um, I think this tiny little worm from China that had like little hairs and it pushed itself in, in the ground there. And, but it wasn't, wasn't that majesty we wanted, it wasn't that kind of majestic way. But once we got that worked out and that kind of law, we started to break it down obviously in a close way and say, okay, how do, how do worms put together? How, what muscles would need to move it around or see it close up? And that was like another big area. So it's almost like the first part we had, the, how does it move in this, recognizing this macro view of this sea of sand? And then the second part is, like, well, how do we resolve, how do we resolve the mouth? <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, Paul, what did Denis want to see in terms of these sandworms i sort of love that they were often hidden but when they were apparent they were apparent i, I think i really enjoyed that approach to the seeing of the sandworms yeah like it it, it was very much a like a kind of like a jaws approach where like you you get to see bits and pieces of the worms but you know and and you know like uh when you see the when you see the worm sign you know like a two when uh, when uh, when Robin was uh, was uh, just uh, discussing, you know, like uh, you know, it's a, as they were as they were doing the animation tests, you know, that was hand in hand with uh, with the effects tests, and like you know, you know, when you when you uh, rise a dune, you know, like a, when you make a dune grow or when you uh, collapse, it, you get all of these ripples, and like. It, it, it 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 just feels like it just feels like water and Denis Denis loved that uh, loved that particular approach and but like he was very adamant that like you know he wanted the he wanted the animation of the worm to be uh, quite quite subtle you know in that in that you know like it, this was a pre prehistoric beast which is a you know like a, which is which has roamed the uh, from the desert for like thousands of years, and and the, there was a particular scene where uh, where the worm meets uh, Paul for the first time, and you know like our, our like first versions of like animation kind of made it feel as if they were both inquisitive about about each other, and like Denis being Denis being Denis, like it, he basically summed it up as no 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 the, the this isn't what I want. I want it to feel as if it is a lobster meeting a goat for the first time. You know, like it, th there is there is no connection between the two. You know, it's just mm. these two objects, <laughs> and so, and and that was that was kind of the approach which which uh, Denis was after. You know, it's a slow lumbering accordion type of uh, type of beast, and mm. yeah, very much a like a, like a, you know how how um, the uh, shark was presented in jaws, you know. What what was the R and D at Deneg, um, say Brian or Tristan, um, for how you would achieve the sand simulations? Because of course they were so massive, um, and had to you know look photorealistic. Um, yeah, so we started, um, I was at the effects team, I should say, started working on this um, just as we were beginning to shoot, which you don't often get on a, on a VFX, VFX show. So we started off, first of all, figuring out how, how do we deform the terrain, you know, the, the sand, as if the creature is, you know, as it's plowing its way through the scene, how do we get that to work? That was, that was the first struggle. I guess even before that, actually, the, the very first thing we had to figure out was can we recreate these sand dunes either from uh, Jordan, the Jordan shoot or the uh, United Arab Emirates shoot? Can we recreate those? Because we need to use the plates. And 
with a lot of hard work, the, the environment scene was able to match that. That then gets passed to effects to do the, it was height field deformation setup for uh, how the actual dunes themselves as a, as a surface to form. Then we had to add the sand, which was, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of sand. So we had, um, if you jump to, if you're able to jump to, I think it's slide 21. Uh, this is the, uh, I guess it's, it's the, the Jaws moment shot. This is one of the first ones we started taking a look at because why not start with the most difficult shot? Uh, we had some footage that we found online of, a, I think it was a truck. I think it was, uh, it was Albert, who I think is in the, in the chat. Albert mm -hmm. uh, Sosiskowitz, who was a, a effects supervisor uh, for the sand, the sand team. Found some footage of a truck pushing a, a, a snowplow with a snowplow in front, pushing its way through some sand, kicking it up into the air. We actually recreate, recreated that in this shot. And it looked great, worked really nicely with the camera moving, that was cool. Then we put the sandworm into the scene and suddenly it felt like it was a, it was a miniature, it was just too small. And at that mm. point we realized sand has got, we've got to have way more sand and the sand's got to be even smaller than it currently was in, in, in that setup. So the guys came up with it with a system of, uh, I think we called it, uh, it's ultra res, where the simulations could pull from a library of different sand setups to help build out and flesh out the scene. Uh, Cause it's not just the area immediately in front of the worm, well, I guess it is in this shot, but it, when it's in the deeper sand, it's the dunes that it's pushing around and also those dunes around it, which are being affected by the vibration of the, this, this creature pushing its way through the, through the sand in its uh, undulating fashion. So yeah, I think time, time was the key bit here and we were, we were lucky enough to, to start quite early on so we could figure out through a process of trial and error, both in terms of how the imagery works, looks and how the simulations worked to get the get the final result yeah similarly we, you know, we had to get our anim sorted because we couldn't afford going around with performance notes with it with all the effects going on so we that's what we started quite early with those, those tests with effects so we knew what was going on so because we can't be jumping around and in, interestingly when we were when we were jumping around the worm very easily we would see if it was right or wrong because the effects doesn't lie, you know. <laughs> so if, if we're moving this giant, giant, giant creature too fast, it's exploding. Um, so the team really got a good handle on exactly the size and scale of it quite quickly. Yeah, it was a great balance, actually. Great balance. Mm. Uh, Robin, as I understand it, you really got down into the details of this worm so much that it could almost talk. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm definitely one for... <laughs> engineering anything to the nth degree because that's what you have to do it's doomed come on yes yeah, so i i did and and <laughs> so for the, for the worm mouth itself um yeah i had to try and work out how it would how it could exist how it could move and articulate and, and it, it was really important to do that because um yes, it's a range of motion which didn't know what we were going to do we had the shots there but you know boards and a bit of previous but we, we wanted to make sure it was logical and Easily, you could even with the with the ornithopters, you could okay, let's put a blend shape here and a blend shape there, and that would work. But it's just not it's not how I work, and it's not how it should be respected. So I was trying to break down, okay, what creatures and, and how could this open and close, and what could we use to do that? And really, quite quickly, looking around, you know, um, worlds, obviously, all the creatures around everywhere. It's, there's not many that can do that, except for human with our orbital muscles around our mouth. So really we started with that. We build an orbital wrestle around the mouth and then look at the muscles around the outside and say, okay, how does this close? Well, it needs muscles all on the inside to flex, to pull that orbital muscle down close and the ones on the outside relax. Or well, how does it twist? I said, we need lattice and orbital, mu orbital muscles that way to push and pull and turn them. So after we had all these muscles in place, I mean, the animators rig was uh, quite crazy, but I, I did say it could sing opera. That's what my, my challenge was. <laughs> um, we didn't really get around to that shot. Um, but um, yeah, and it, it worked because, you know, when we're opening and closing and we're swallowing a, a giant um, uh, sand crawler, it's um, sand harvester, I beg your pardon. It, it had to move. It can't just be a, a, a straight close and open because it wouldn't. I mean, a, mm. a creature wouldn't do that. It would move parts of its mouth and relax the others and slowly pull it down, you know. It, Paul, I, I believe as well, it's it, the sandworms represent something where sound design and VFX really came together well. 
Yeah, so like usually, usually like you don't uh, you don't really have have like such crossover. But like there were two particular uh, instances where where like uh, basically visual effects had to wait on sound and sound had to wait on uh, visual effects. And th this was this was uh, this was a particular case for for the uh, throat of the worm. So there was a bit of backwards and forwards between between uh, Robin's team and. And and the uh, sound team and like the other one was with the um, with the personal shields and uh, and like uh, tweaking tweaking the personal shields based on based on uh, on the, the sound. So yeah, yeah. So that that kind of thing doesn't doesn't usually happen in post production. It's, it's it's you know because usually the sound department is so busy in its own mm. world and the visual effects is so busy in its own world. But these were these were two actual points where like a to actually had to come together, work together, to then like go off and finish the work. I think it's also awesome. actually for the, with the audio quickly on that one, Ian. The, the the again, there's so many signatures in doing it showed how it respected the reality of it. When you when you're after the sandworm, and I'm like, okay, what's the audio going to be so I can work out what the throat is going to be? You know, some films would just go, oh yeah, it's going to have a it's a monster, it's going to have a big roar. But you know, it's a this is a worm. It lives in a sand. I mean, it doesn't need to roar. I mean, most things don't need to roar anyway. So why would it? And it the sound that came out was really organic, and I, I loved. It. I was like, this is brilliant because it's logical. It's, it doesn't need to expel sound. So then I could help with the animating design what the inside of the mouth and throat would look like to pulsate and make that noise, which we did some great reference footage of inside of these larynx, which was disgusting but brilliant. But yeah, that was that was another thing with sound design. They they came up with a mm. really bi logical biological way of doing it, and it just yeah bedded in that creature. There's just one more thing I want to mention about sandworms before moving on, and if we can go to slide 22, I think it is. It's the worm at night. There's this concept of the mega frame, something that I've talked to the guys about, where they shot some IMAX frames, but they needed even larger area. Can you guys talk about that? Because that, of course, is something big in the film in terms of having shot some of the um, plates on IMAX. Yeah, the uh, the uh, film was shot with the same camera, which was an um, Arri LF, but um, different different sequences used different lenses. And uh, um, I, uh, anything out in the desert was uh, was uh, going to be IMAX and. Basically, it's it's much more of a square format. Now, when you go to a normal cinema, which is an, an IMAX cinema, like you you like have to cut the top and bottom of the IMAX frame uh, for the two three nine presentation in the cinema. And like sometimes sometimes that cut is like animated; it will go up and down depending on on the content on the screen. Now we've got twenty nine shots in the movie where basically we couldn't get a proper cutout you know like Denis wasn't happy with the framing we couldn't animate the mm. framing and that basically it just didn't fit so what the guys and girls had to do was basically extend the frames out either side so what you see on this particular shot for example is that you have the IMAX frame in in the center it it's been angled back for for a uh, creative purposes but then um the actual 239 version of this has an extension either side which is then shrunk down to fit in into 239 and i believe uh I believe tristan you worked at 7k for all or, or like you you're like final renders were actually uh, 7k for these uh 29 shots yeah, if you listen really carefully you can still hear the render farm screaming uh, yeah no it was uh, 7k <laughs> and i think that was I think that was a, a t t uh, just over twenty odd shots. I think we ha we had to do uh, for that, but I think it, it definitely helps because, like I say, if you did if you cropped in on this uh, for two three nine, it wouldn't yeah wouldn't have the same impact. Yeah. Am I remembering right that we had two or three shots that we actually did basically different versions, different layouts, just together? Yes. Yeah, there was so no composition that looked right for both a widescreen and an IMAX. Well, yeah, because so these were was... so graphical, weren't they, Paul? They were so like mm -hmm. symbolic, like. You exactly, in, exactly. in a certain way yeah. in one format that it would just lose yeah. the impact of the entire sequence yeah totally, totally. there was one shot 
Yeah, there was one shot in particular, and that's the one where um, Paul is at the bottom of frame and the worm is rising up in frame, and basically you don't get to see the mouth of uh, the worm come in, come in from the top. And there was just no way that we could get the same feeling in the IMAX and the 239 because basically Denis wanted the frame to be full of worm basically and like if we if we had extended it and like you know you would have seen more of the background so those two shots were actually two different shot numbers because they were two different shots you know it was it was rendered differently it was uh, it was uh, it was it was animated differently so so yeah I encourage uh, you know um, back 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 when it was still out, I was encouraging people to see both versions because they are different. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's why IMAX and the 239. So unfortunately, you can't see the IMAX anymore, but one day I hope. One day. Uh, let's move on to, um, we're going to talk about Paul's Fremen fighting vision. This is a sequence that when I learned that it was fully CG, I was incredibly surprised. I, I felt, of course, there was some sort of crowd stuff going on in the background, but to learn that you and Dean Egg orchestrated a motion capture shoot for this and um, realized the sequence in CG. Robin, just coming to you, what was it like doing that motion capture um, for this sequence? It was a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I think but, terrifying uh, covers it. I remember you at the time. I remember the exact meeting huge. with Paul about it. Mm. And, um, mm. you know, it was, it was, it's one of the hardest, but again, one of the most satisfying shots I think I've been a part of, fortunately. But this is Dune. This is what we like. It's true. All of us in this call like the hard work because that's the good stuff. So when we got this, you know, when, when we got something like this, originally it was it was lots of individual shots and uh, we had this kind mm. of sequence um, and it, it morphed and changed into some amazing work from Roger Yuang, who's the stunt coordinator, worked with the stunties, did some stunt viz and come up with these incredible fight sequences and different styles, like little vignettes. It was good because you see obviously the Fremen and their beauty and the Sardaukar and theirs. And then it slowly started to merge in about, how about we stitch them all together? I think Paul, you said it in one of our calls, we're like, well, I don't wanna. And uh, <laughs> it came through, but it was like, okay, okay. So we, we were, you know, it was a challenge before, even before what happened afterwards, it was hard, you know, but um, yeah, we, we, we took it and tried to come up with the idea of really rough blocking. How could we stitch these together and get a CG camera through that that didn't look jarring and still look like a battle. So we we kind of it was a big long puzzle piece of how to work that back and forth with the stunt crew, um, who were again I can't say any more good words about them of how it came together. But you know, as as Paul knows, just before we were going to do a very complex motion capture shoot, you know, COVID hit really hard and and had changed the landscape of everything. So. We had to take a break and we had to come back and slightly thankful we had more time to kind of puzzle piece some ideas together but we had to change how we operated and and we had to have a certain amount of of, of stunties at a certain time so i had to time capturing these moments in a certain way utilizing only a certain amount of people so it's like a big mass problem so then we had to yeah, work out how we did that with the amount of people the amount of time and eventually we had to do it all remotely um so this is very new for a lot of us and paul was thankfully there um with a, a good friend of mine eric reynolds and an amazing ad for an amazing stunt crew and i was an ipad a head on an ipad i think somewhere and and denis was as well and i mean denis was amazing for it considering it's not something he's totally used to but it was just thank, it's just the, the amount of planning we had to go through and we had to get it correctly. And the amount of everyone was on board. It's, I guess it was towards the end, the last throws of the, of the, of the project, one of the last big beats. But because of the good stunt work, um, because of the planning we did before for other motion capture and everyone was on board, it, it, I'm so surprised how well it came together. I mean, that's on back to everyone involved because that's what it needed. But yes, once we had all those puzzle pieces, we, we, we kind of put it back into the studio. But it was a huge operation because we didn't have a um, fully fledged out, like automated way to solve all the crowd in simulations. We just mm. used all these capture uh, elements and stitched them and selected them. So then it was a, a, a contest of how do we orchestrate and choreograph 
a giant war with all these beautiful pieces so we can read the Fremen battle, read the Sardaukar. It can't be just all Fremen flair. It had to be a, an equal fight um, and, and travel through, not overwhelm Paul um, and still keep him clear, but not clear it out so there's nothing else in there. So it's really complicated, but it was just a, a mixture. Then the effects came in, which was brilliant. It's a big sort of explosion in the middle, which has this lovely sand over it. And we throw a little sand on the end. It was, it was a real kind of big orchestra of work, I think, um, to get to the end result. Um, yeah, I was really, really proud of it. Still, I still keep looking at it like, I'm like, is there something I've missed? But what happened <laughs> was, because it was all these hand vignettes, it gave this kind of authenticity I mean, sometimes, like if you've done this for a while, you can see simulations and you can see, well, mm. that was done by a massive or something, you know, you can, say, oh, you can tell for some reason. But because this is all individual, then, you know, the animators keyframed and, and move to get positions and silhouettes, it was all incredibly bespoke. It's like the mm. best tailored bespoke suit you could ever get. <laughs> and Paul, do you want to add anything to that? Oh, schedule. I was just going to say, it's a, it was a 15 week schedule for this because the mocap had to run so late which sounds like a long time, but for work of this complexity, it really isn't. Yeah, it's, mm. it's a phenomenal achievement because there was nothing could really start until we got the mocap. So everything was dependent on everything else. It was, uh, I was, I was so impressed with the guys. They came through so well on it. Yeah, really the, 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 absolutely. Uh, adored the shot and, uh, you know, just the process of, of like going, going through a uh, motion capture is definitely something which like he's going to be doing again so you know he's um he, he was uh he was he was a little bit nervous about the process but like yeah robin robin and the guys did a did a uh, fantastic job and you know it's uh, really really successful also hey, Ian, uh, question before we move on from sand uh i was wondering can we can you bring up slide 25 i just wanted to mention um the sandstorm uh which you know plays a role in addition obviously to the to the worm and the sand yes um it, it kind of tells a story that uh you know was obviously not easy to to do as well in terms of you know we have sequences where you know we introduce the the sandstorm itself which uh you know uh our uh, effects supervisor um, Lucas uh, Janin and uh, Cody Stoof were were on, as well as Al Alexander Jarosh was that he did all the heavy lifting. But in to to first of all to get the look of of the sandstorm from the front, um, we relied on again something real. Or National Geographic was our friend in this situation. Um, <laughs> And basically, we found a great face-on view of it from, um, I think it was in Southern Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa somewhere. And Paul was just like, "Okay, yeah, if you if you match that exactly, then we then then we'll move on." <laughs> so, <laughs> one of the great things is like that we always had in the show, which is you know everything from concept work that was that was fully realized and and approved and and so you know building the spaceport for example we we just had to copy it exactly um to the sandstorm where we're using mother nature to guide us in terms of how big it is the performance how little it moves really uh and and you know just what that looks like from the front inside and from the top um that was a that was quite a, a, a task in and of itself that um was very rendering intensive uh needless to say <laughs> but you know obviously you know we had a lot of we had a lot of great reference um uh, uh to to work from so i just wanted to you know mention that aspect of it because you know obviously that that was that was a journey as well to figure out what that should look like especially from the inside and on the top you know views that you you don't normally see um, um, I don't know if you want to expand on that, Paul. Yeah, it's a, it's a, you know like a, the great thing, the great thing about Dune is that is that you have all of these different 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 environments, and like I know that uh, uh, this one was a was a really heavy one for Dina 
Montreal. It's you know, it's it's you know, again, it goes back to the back to reference. You know, like a, the key to a to a, a successful visual effect is if like there is something which like you can copy, especially for like something where the director wants his movie to be uh, uh, photo real and grounded, right? So, so yeah, and like a, the guys and girls did a uh, fantastic job in, in in like trying to trying to convey this this like huge um, sandstorm which like doesn't move a lot. So like you know like sometimes like it can feel like it's a it's a still frame, but like when you like uh, scrub it forwards and backwards, there is like such a complexity of of uh, of, uh, of uh, some movement in there. So yeah, it was it was very well done, very well done. Brilliant! I'm so glad you brought that up, Brian. Um, we're going to move on to Arakeen, and I sort of thought we might combine the concept of building this city, but also attacking attacking it. Paul, just coming back to you. I, this is the kind of sequence and, and the views of Arakeen where you could really feel like the concept art and designs and set builds were translated into the visual effects work. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So, so Denis and Patrice had, had spent about eight months prior to mm. uh, pre-production, like, uh, like uh, when I joined, where like they had uh, concepted a lot of the movie. So like uh, they had a, uh, they had made visuals for like uh, for like Arakeen and for Kitty Prime and and for and for and for all of the worlds. And usually, what what happens with the concept work is it's like a springboard for for uh, for more ideas. But Denis was so enamoured with uh, with uh, with all of the visuals that like you know he stuck he stuck really closely to. Uh, to uh, to what the assets and you know like the actual builds should be so so basically Patrice the uh, the uh, production designer actually built those worlds based on those concepts and we built our digital virtual worlds based on those concepts and you know Harry yeah. Keane was in a was a huge build in that in that like we actually found an area in uh, Jordan in Wadi Ram where like uh, we went on we went on a scout and we were in a helicopter and like we did a flyby into this area and uh Denis saw this point said this is where I want to uh, this is where I want Arakeen to be so that then set off like like uh, months of 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 uh, of uh, scanning and texturing work in that in that uh, particular part of a uh, of a uh, body run so like a uh, you know uh, I think it was clear angle who actually went out there and used like drones and like uh, high powered uh, scanning devices and like basically like you know we captured all of those rocks and 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 uh, and uh, all of that area so that uh, so that we could then replicate it to then make shots where like we could then make the uh, uh, the the uh, camera free basically and and it's like some of the beautiful imagery which you see here here now and you know like the actual build for for Arakeen took a took a very long time and Janet said it was like what 15 percent of the it was easily that yeah it just kept growing and growing didn't it yeah and you know did just the just the small little subtleties of like having having sand piled on uh, mm. on the uh, city from a particular direction because of the wind you know it was all it was all designed so that like this city is a is a, is a, is in a really harsh environment like you don't see people around because it because like people aren't 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 going to get into the sun if they don't have to and like you know it's a it's a it's a it's a protection from the uh from the environment and Denis wanted uh, these uh these uh these amazing uh, fly throughs but you know to to like give us give us the actual sense of scale for uh, for Arakeen, which then matched to all of the interior builds which we did you know it was a huge undertaking a lot yeah. of effects <clears throat> going on in there because there was a lot of blowing sand and all those little yeah. things that give it scale and life and you know, exactly. it'd be hard to pick exactly. out but it would have looked a lot yeah yeah totally because like yeah, yeah, totally. Like yeah. usually, like you have, 
you can have like small little details to like help with the scale. Like, you know, you, you can have handrails in there and people and that kind of thing, but they didn't want any of that. So it just made it a little bit more challenging to like try and sell that sense of scale because it's mm. very easy for it to look like a miniature if you don't recognize something in there to like try and try and uh, ground you to to uh, to uh, to uh, what the scale is. So that the, there's a heck of a lot of texture work and, and that kind of thing going on as well. And unfortunately, yeah, it was, it to was, oh, go ahead. Just, just gonna say, just quickly, uh, for the, the shield wall, the city was designed for the wind to blow over that shield wall that you can see in the distance there into the city. Uh, and I think the buildings were kind of you can sort of see them here as sloped facing the um, facing the wall. So the design mm. idea for most of the buildings was that the sand was then able to flow over them. So we did run simulations on on the city as a whole with some dust blowing through here. You can see through the just about through the stream, uh, and also. That simulation was used for the areas where the sand gathered in, in amongst the, the cracks and the the, uh, the crannies, which uh, which Paul mentioned earlier. Mm. So quite a lot of quite a lot of detail went into it, and this is yeah using photogrammetry from the drones. So when we were in Jordan, we had a dedicated drone unit that that went out there, and as a testament to how harsh the desert is, the drone actually got broken at one point. Uh, either too hot or I think, it was, I think it was sand in the in the lens if I remember which they fixed really quickly it didn't affect the schedule or anything but just mm. a testament to how harsh that environment actually actually is oh, amazing and then you know when the attack occurred I wanted to talk to um, you guys of course about the destruction here um, just just quickly Paul what what sort of practical effects or even miniatures or consideration of miniatures were there for any of these building destructions and other kinds of things? You know, we did talk about miniatures for 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 a while, and like a, we were actually uh, in in big uh, in big discussions about about trying to build one of the um, Harkonnen uh, ships, which come down the, the one where uh, the uh, uh, the airbags come out and. We were going to build a, a scale version of that and then blow it up, but um, but what tends to happen with these things? Yeah, one of these ships, um, because like basically it it was going to be made with all these little tiny pieces, and then like we we're going to explode it, and like you would have this beautiful explosion with all these tiles uh, flying off. But you know what tends to happen with miniatures is, is that you usually have to build a digital version of it as well, and it's, mm. then it's kind of a mixture as a between the two and you know budget wise like uh, we just we just couldn't afford that and you know like we we also talked about do, doing like potentially doing some of the structures as miniatures but again it would then need a digital version but also you know like some of the some of the structures weren't that didn't have a lot of geometry geometry difference in there so like you know i felt i felt comfortable that like you know that having Having this this kind of texture work would be uh, would be okay in in uh, in a CG, but then you know, for this uh, for this particular sequence, now obviously we didn't have get an explosion this big because this thing is 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 almost nuclear. But what we did do for for like some of the running uh, where like Gurney is running towards the ships. Is that like we 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 had great big fireballs on set to uh, provide the interactive lighting? So, so like and like you know, those were timed for uh, particular particular moments, which like then then in post we would then add add like some of the amazing CG explosions, which we had uh, uh, which we had developed. Now we did shoot a couple of explosions on the backlog in Budapest just for reference and I don't believe they actually made it into the film but and they were only used for reference but but yeah again it's a it's it's a it's a continuing theme in uh, in June was was trying to get the best light trying to get the best light because you know uh, we're at a point in visual effects right now is that you can get any piece of footage and you can change the background you can ch you can change any background you want like right now we could take any of the presenters here and put like Disney, Disneyland behind them. But if the lighting on the foreground doesn't match the lighting in the background, there isn't much you can do about it. You know, mm. you can have the most perfect edges and, 
and that kind of thing. But if that intent isn't isn't the same, it, it's always going to look like a comp. So like we've made a massive push to to like try and get interactive light to be you know like hence the you know like using like the Sanskrit, hence using the fibers, hence hence you know shooting the ornithopter interiors out in daylight and that kind of thing is it you know it's all these different different techniques to like try and to, to like try and give us the best basis and you know this sequence where like uh where like you see gurney gurney running along and stuff it was, it was just covered in fireballs and, and and like we shot it at night you know and all of those all the heat and noise from those fireballs actually kept you awake during that scene when the, when like uh we were actually shooting it but but yeah you know it's a it's a constant push to to like get the best light for mm. us right uh, brian and tristan do you want to mention anything about dean egg's approach here to both um destruction and explosions i mean as, as paul mentioned there there were some explosions shot on set which we uh, which, uh lisa nolan and her team that were mostly in charge of the uh, effects fire and explosion section of the movie um set about recreating it and it was actually a very tricky process. You're actually trying to sculpt fire and explosions in, in places. But that's the sort of level of detail that the guys went into to match something that's a real world explosion so you can put it into the scenes and then try and make that work. There was another layer of complexity to that because you can't just scale up an explosion. It, it doesn't work that way. So they have to be simulated at size. And if I'm correct, uh, from what Reese mentioned recently to me, uh, who was the CG supervisor, so Reese Salcom, the explosion here, the gamma bomb blast, is uh, about five kilometers high in uh, at its at its uh, oh, maximum that's height. Familiar. So it's it's, it's pretty big. Um, didn't didn't and, yeah. say it, they want their popcorn to fall out of the hands when they see it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was I think that was the brief, uh, and I think I think the guys hit it, and um, then um, just. Destruction-wise, you have all this the great uh, builds that were done for the buildings here and in uh, Arakeen and the ships here as well. But well, they all had to be built to be destroyed as well. So there's custom versions of them made. So when they do explode, certainly the ships and the internals fold outwards. I think it was uh, Chris Phillips who was working on that shot there, if I remember correctly. I apologize if that's wrong. But the internals of the ships then get revealed by the blast behind it and all of the different pieces which are come pinwheeling out and, and flying off it's uh becomes very very complicated even mm. with just one in those scenes but there's there's obviously quite a few uh, and then again a bit later on in the movie uh i don't know if we have a slide for that i guess it's slide 40 if we can jump to that sorry we're jumping around a bit we can, we can come back but you've got the destruction of the uh the marketplace here with the lasers carving through this is a uh, chris again i think um as a theme building here destroying all this stuff this is the fly through this isn't actually the shot you can see the detail that was gone into here all the different things that were built how much geometry was in there for these um structures which got got fully destroyed rumble collapse and then the dust clouds which are, are simulated from that as well uh, along with explosions uh, laser flying ships uh, it's it's nearly got everything in there it's, it's pretty complicated <laughs> This was the point job. where my voice went up about three octaves, I think, when I was saying, we didn't build it to be destroyed. <laughs> and we did build it to be destroyed. I, I did always love the logic behind everything. I, I remember talking, hearing Reese talk about building the city and it's like, you know, this, this squadron over here and they would live over here and there'd be a place over here and this is a corridor and there'd be districts over here. It's, everything was thought out in a way which would make sense. Even when the bomb went off, the snowflake bomb goes through the shield, it's like, okay, where would the power bar be for where the deactivate the shield be in the level of the ship to go down in the middle or down on the outside? These conversations we were having were like immense. It was amazing. Mm. And, and Tristan, just on that laser, I, I'm sure that you and I previously talked about this laser and the kind of discussions that were had about it. Um, am I right about that? Something about how it had to look quite plane but of course it wreaks a lot of destruction that, that's right yeah i think that the brief was it can't look too showy it just needs to be practical and i think so it was based on some of the work that brian you and your team had done yeah. in the um in kind's lab when they're, they're cutting through the door i don't know if you want to speak about that a bit yeah I, um uh that day i think paul you were on second unit uh and so i 
got the opportunity to sub in on main unit. And it was myself, Denis and Greg and Chris on a closed set. And we talked about the laser and, and how we would approach the sequence and shooting it. And of course, I've done some laser movies in my career. So <laughs> I had some ideas and um, about it turning on and off and dodge and weave. But um, Denis, he turned to me and, and he said, Brian, I want this to be the most boring laser you've ever done. And, and, and he kind of walked away and then he turned around and, put, and then he said, but I want it to look cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, right. so basically, you know, then we started thinking in terms of, a, you know, a surgeon or something very precise and almost not even there, but you know, it's, it's very precise. So that's, it took a few iterations to come up with that look, but I think um, at the end, uh, everybody was happy with it, but yeah, that, that, that you can tell that that kind of carries over into the broader sense of, of you know, what Tristan and his, his team has was accomplished that, that kind of works just like the, the personal shield, um, that 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 you know that Tristan and his team mm. came up and then they made it on a larger scale for all of the uh, the explosions. Yeah. Okay, we're racing to finish this now. I really want to quickly mention something about training shields um, and some invisible effects as well in the film. Can we jump to the training shields uh, slides? Um, just. Quickly, in terms of the look and feel of these, I, of course, love the original David Lynch training shields, but these were something special as well. Yeah, yeah. So these were, so, so we would, um, I had a couple of artists out with me in pre-production, you know, the idea being to, to, uh, to like try and do some quick tests to, to like help inform us if like we needed to do anything particular in the shoot and like, we we like worked on the training shields um to like to like see if like we needed to add any interactive light and that kind of thing and um joel uh, uh started doing some tests on a piece of uh work uh, on on a piece of footage from the seventh samurai and like you know basically he, he was playing with with um uh, using past and future frames and like what we found was that was like there was a very pleasing pleasing effect if like you know he took he took a bunch of frames and he compressed them all together and we showed this to Denis and like he, he loved it and and like basically we then applied it to like some of the stunt um some of the stunt of his work which was being done you know with Paul and and with uh, and 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 with like some of the stunt players to actually practice this and like we applied it to that look as well and and again like a Denis, Denis really liked it now we thought that we had cracked it very very early on but it was only once we got into a uh, post where and like and I actually got the edit that um some of the scenes became so uh, you you couldn't really work out what was going on because of the intensity of the fighting and that and that's mm. where the idea of the color came in, you know, adding adding the uh, adding the blue and red, and and part of the process as well was that like I didn't want to keep it so procedural, so so uh, like it took it took a certain type of composite to be able to like paint uh, to paint out some of the effect and paint back in some of the the effect because I wanted to keep it a little bit organic so that so that it didn't feel so uh, so uh, procedural, but like. There were certain rules to the to the uh, process which like, Tristan can uh, perhaps expand on. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So this was um, as you mentioned there, uh, Joel uh, Del Virgin had figured something out on set that was like that. We had that idea to move forward into this sequence and and some of the other sequences for the shield effect itself, and it, it all is all is all image based before and after frames. Where there's enough movement in there, if there wasn't, then we had to introduce a slight. It's like shimmering so that we could um we could get that shield effect uh to work uh and it was you know it was peter Farkas and his uh, his compositing team there was a select few compas that were on this sequence painstakingly 
painting these frames up. It wasn't a punishment. It was just so that they had a, a good eye for how this sort of thing works because it, it needed quite a quite a delicate hand, a specific uh, artist, as, as Paul mentioned there, to get this to work because it needs to feel like a quite a subtle effect, but still be readable and work in tandem with their motion as well, with it with the motion of the sword coming in or hand contact uh, and things like that. And then, as Paul said, uh, later on in the development, the idea for the colours came in, yeah, for blue. Right. Blue for the kinetic repulsion and then uh, red for the uh, actual shield uh, mm. penetration. Okay. And just the final thing we're going to look at before I um, go through some questions is some invisible effects in the film. I feel like most of the visual effects are invisible in some ways, um, but I don't feel any of this stuff has been shown before. So, um, Paul, do you want to quickly mention what's going on here with the head? Yeah, so uh, obviously we're using a skull cap on, uh, on Piter and Denise felt that like it, sometimes it felt uh, too big. So, uh, so um, uh, Tristan came up with a with a, a cool, cool procedure to to actually help uh, um, make it um, substantially smaller, so that like you know it didn't it didn't just feel like a uh, a uh, skull cap. Awesome, and then there's some another great invisible effect here with um, uh, oh this is Baron. Right, I don't, I don't know if I've seen this one. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of the shot was uh, in camera, but Denis then wanted to add the um, the uh, suspenser on the on the, the Baron's back. So that's a so that's a digital addition, which like uh, which like we didn't shoot in camera. So the, the, every time you see those lights come on, like a, what is in the black bath as well. That's a, that's a, that's a CG addition. It's a quite, quite a hard one to track this because when we shot this, like this idea of the suspenser wasn't going to be there. It, it was only, it only happened in post. So, and as you can see, like the rest of the shot is in camera and there isn't much to actually grab onto that one <laughs> to, uh, to be able to track that on. So. Testament to the tracking team, yeah, 3D and uh, 2D was used to try and make this work. Awesome. And here's the final invisible effect, which I think is um, something no one would have noticed, uh, Duncan's outfit change. Someone want to jump in about this one? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, so the guys, I mean, uh, yeah, I had, to, I had to change him just, just from a story point, sorry, Paul. Um, I think when this was shot originally, he was in his uh, frame and armor and we had to change it into the white shirt because it was just after the, he started to make his escape from uh, from the uh, from the palace. So um, yeah, yeah, some class sims, a... simulating straps, that stuff. Yeah, like what tends to happen like uh, during the editing process it, is that like you then like you suddenly end up with uh, with a want for a shot which like wasn't shot so that then like you then try to figure out okay what could we do to to uh to uh to try and get that shot and this one this one actually worked out worked out really well i can't remember what scene is when duncan is uh in his friend suit inside of an i thought it could be when when he was going to meet paul and jessica after the attack on anakin which didn't make the cuts and Mm. And it, it was yeah. so yeah. it's, it's yeah. reused, reused here it's almost thankless work uh because you yeah you just don't know i guess the biggest thanks yeah. is you just didn't know so yeah. mm. some, some top work brilliant i think that's such a fun note to end on in terms of our chat thank you everyone for staying with us for more than an hour and a half um to uh hear about the vfx of june we are going to go through some of your questions now I thought one that popped up very early that I've kept an eye on is this one. How do you deal with the professional disappointment when shots or scenes are cut out? I mean, it's part of everyday filmmaking. Um, you know, are some of the shots nearly unfinished? Are they basically finished and cut out? What is that like personally? Janet, I'm going to actually ask you that question first. Yeah, it's uh, it, it depends who you ask, I suspect. We're pretty brutal in production. We just go, yay, great, and tick it off the list. I think it's a lot more heartbreaking <laughs> for the people who've actually been 
putting their heart and soul into things for the last few weeks. So, yeah, I mean, it's it can be rough on the artists. This was actually not that heavy a film. I mean, I said mm. at the beginning, there were about 130 shots that we worked on that didn't make it in, which sounds like a lot. But uh, Denis is clearly pretty in control of his vision from very early on in the film. And there really weren't that many shots that that we got a huge way into before um, before they went out. There's always some, and there were one or two that we were quite sad about. There were quite a few length cut downs. That's where a lot of the, uh, the work comes in. Some of the Paul's vision shots were a lot longer in their original form, which, you know, it's probably a good thing that yeah. they got shorter yeah, from the point of view of delivering them. But no, it wasn't a very, very heavy mm. um, shots going away. At film. Yeah. So this one, not too heartbreaking. Don't know about you, Paul. Were there any you really missed? No, like, well, I know that, like, going through the whole up and down during during the uh, editorial process, like, sometimes the sequence would, uh, would disappear and then like, sometimes it would come back and it would come back <laughs> with... with not a lot of time left so you know like you know it's always about trying to trying to keep the pacing in the cut so so you know Denise gonna Denise and Joe Walker the editor are, are going to try different ideas so like so like suddenly a sequence is there and then you know, suddenly it's not but yeah like you know as an artist myself you know like a, I've been doing this for, 20, for 25 years at, at, at the very beginning it was uh, it was tough but but now it's uh, it's 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 run of the mill, you know. Like it's yeah. it, it's part of the process to make the best the best story you can, and sometimes great work gets uh, gets gets uh, gets gets on the gets put on the cutting room floor. But you know, it, it, it's for the greater good, you know. But yes, at, at the beginning, it was uh, it was tough. <laughs> it's definitely dude was one where things just uh, used to turn up for like okay what's what's next we're like oh what is this we've got this in there now okay this is great <laughs> so dude was full of surprises i think all the way to the very end yeah it's great mm. awesome um a technical question here was whether dna creating any created any special algorithms or software particularly for the sand particles is that something you can answer brian tristan or janet or Robin. I don't know about uh, um, algorithms, but certainly certainly systems were made to. Um, oh, there you go. Albert's just uh, yeah in just the up. He was chat. The, he was a supervisor. VDB points and VDB <laughs> wrangle. Uh, so yes, yeah. So certain knows. things were created. <laughs> certain things were created to to try and make life as easy as possible. It still didn't make it uh, easy per se, but there was just so much of the sand to 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 get get it working right if you didn't have enough in there as i mentioned earlier on it you know the scale breaks completely so anything and anything that could be done to help uh, make that process work and also help it through the farm is one, perhaps one of the big things that you know, just trying to render it sometimes was tricky also, yeah i mean I um, at, on 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 our side you know for the sandstorm we had to be very strategic uh, about what was rendered because it, it was it was massive you know i think 10k by 5k by 5 or something um to fly through so to come up with that and and just being able to render things in a you know distributed fashion um definitely there was there was some some glue and r d behind uh that was figured out in order to just to be able to to not just see them in an, in a timely manner, to so we could iterate, uh, but but also to render them uh, at the end uh, and not have actually a sandstorm feel noisy, which I know sounds funny. <laughs> awesome. This is a question for everyone, and I'll go through everyone here. What um, shot was the most impactful for you once you saw it with you know the final um layer of editing grading and also Hans Zimmer's score Paul I may as well start with you is there one particular sequence that was just even though you'd been working on it was still particularly impactful at that point well oh, there there are there are so many you know like a, I got the you know like a, I I got the benefit of like seeing seeing the movie multiple times as mm. like a, as like we were coming to a 
to uh, to a finish and you know it's a, each time i saw it i was uh, i was taken straight away uh by the story and 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 by the visuals i think you know the, 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 it, it's like hard to to put one particular thing down because like there were so many awesome techniques used which gave us great visuals i think i think you know things like seeing arakeen things like seeing the hologram sequence things like seeing seleucus segundus it's all very different seeing the ornithopters i you know what you know i don't have a particular particular yeah. favorite because like you know that they're, they're all my favorites honestly but 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 yeah it's I, i'm 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 super proud and like each time i see the film you know, they, they, I, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I totally get a sense of wonder from it. You know, mm. well, Paul, you're allowed to say everything's your favourite, but everyone else has to say one particular scene. <laughs> Robin, what was yours? Oh, jeez, why me first? Well, <laughs> yeah, I think, honestly, the biggest thing watching it was the the sound design and the, the score just blew my socks off. Absolutely, just I was so. Happy. I was like, as soon as I heard, saw the honor top to sound, I was like, it just makes our work elevate even further than I thought it could. Mm. Um, so I would say honor top does, I would say obviously eating the sandworm. But I said the biggest one was Seleucus Secundus, because I never heard the sound of the kind of uh, the, the throat, the throat uh, singing. Yeah. Uh, mm. That was like, oh wow, what's that? Mm. So I think that was one of my favorite bits that impacted me, but I'd have to say, mm, sandworm. <laughs> okay <laughs> Je Janet you're up um I think that well when I saw it in the cinema which is obviously the first time you see something in context I think probably the scenes of the first arrival at, um on, on Arrakis as everybody's getting off the ships and that's largely because that was done by Brian's team in Montreal and I hadn't seen it as much and so it was more of a surprise to me and, and it had such scale and I love mm. the bagpipers, <laughs> but uh, it, had, you know, it was just something that, that really introduced me to things in a way that I hadn't had a chance. To, I hadn't sat in dailies and seen it every morning for two years. And, uh, and it was a great, great introduction, I think, to, um, to everybody and everything mm. in the film. It was wonderful. Awesome. Brian? Thank you, Janet. I appreciate that, first of all. <laughs> but, you know, honestly, um, I, of course, I'm privy to uh, that part of the movie where we built the the spaceport and 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 you know populated it, textured it, lit it, added sand, um, and and but most importantly, kind of laid the the foundation for how huge and hot and arid and you know what what Dune. Uh, and, uh, you know, Arrakis is like, you know, kind of like the introduction of it all and the size and the scale of the, the spaceships, um, all that pomp and circumstance of the arrival. Um, yeah, I was very, I'm, I'll always be very proud and, and happy of, of the team, you know, of the DNIC teams that helped us in Mumbai as well um, to, do, to do those. I mean, because it turns out when you have a huge open space, you know, making that come across and then making it feel real um, is not a, such a, a, an easy task. So um, the fact that we were able to kind of open up and get and introduce the audience to the storytelling of it all, um, yeah, that just, I, it always puts a smile on my face. So that would be mine. Awesome. Interesting. Um, yeah, I think as Janet said, when you see it in a cinema, the first thing that hits you from having looked at silent images for so long is the sound, and it's that that is uh, it's a loud it's a loud movie, and it's it is designed that way. I've spoken to the guys, either I'm getting too old or I don't know, but it, the, the sound was was uh, sort of hits you like a like a wall, which uh, which I think was great. And I sequence wise, I it's a tricky one because I had the, the, the sound web stuff to look after, and then the destruction of the spaceport as well. But I think. Spaceport one was good because of just just to see all the the uh, the chaos and the carnage and, and all the action come together with that sound, with that um, score as well, uh, particularly the sound that those little uh, the that the bombs make that the uh, the Harkonnens drop. 
uh, onto the ships, drill through the shield and make, make them explode. Um, that was pretty great to see on the on the big screen and you sort of push back into your seat whilst it's going on. Yeah. It was, I know, it was, I guess that's the experience I, I remember remember the most seeing for the first time seeing it on the on the big screen with sound yeah awesome i'm Ian, afraid we... go ahead Ian, paul what's your favorite sequence from jen <laughs> i like all of them i like uh, all of them uh, wait a minute <laughs> well, you need us. There's, a, there's a rule <laughs> I, I am obsessed with the desert mouse because I have a weird problem with stuffies and I remember seeing right. the behind right. the scenes stuff. And of course, I feel like the desert mouse sequence has a lot of meaning to do with Paul. Clearly it does. Yeah. And I thought you, um, the team, the visual effects team did such a great job in just making that a very subtle scene as well. So that's yeah. one of my faves. I love Mao Deep. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's easy. One of those things I thought could be, you know, potentially removed because it's a, it's a different rhythm in the film and shows a different kind of dynamic, but it's, it's so metaphorical. Um, but the, yeah, it was in, very hard to do so close up with all those things. Mm. Hats up to mm. all the CFX and everyone in that. It was brilliant. Awesome. This might have to be the final question. I'm so sorry we couldn't get to everything, but um, we really have been going for quite a long time. Paul, someone mentioned the deleted scene with Duncan and possibly using some LED walls. It's also featured in Tanya's um, Art and Soul of June book, which I just bought, and it was nice to see some behind the scenes there. Could you briefly talk about utilising some LED walls and what that scene was going to be, and then we'll wrap up? Yeah, so it was, it was actually going to be a sequence which was going to open uh, the movie where, where, where you're going to see Duncan... Um, uh, Scott basically skydived down, down into uh, down to, down into Arrakis. Um, but it, it it was um it got it got abandoned pretty early because uh, because basically Tanisha changed his uh, changed his uh, his uh, his uh, his approach. But you know, mm -hmm. like uh, having used an LED wall uh, screen before for like uh, the first man, it just felt appropriate to. Uh, to 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 go down that to go down that particular route because that basically we were going to be out in space and we had the planet Arrakis on the uh, on the LED wall and you know and uh, the idea was that Duncan was going to fall on a rig towards these uh, towards the planet you know and it, it actually worked out pretty well it, it it just didn't fit the narrative which uh, Tony was after. Mm. Well, brilliant. Um, actually, one final thing, Paul, if you're prepared to do this, can you show everyone what your background is right now? I think that's really fun. The visual effects supervisor of June made a very special effort to ensure that his hair was properly keyed and faced. Well, it's not properly keyed. It's terrible. It's, it's, it's like, oh, my goodness, I can't stand this keying thing. If you can turn off the background, then we will finish. But I really wanted to say thank you to everyone for tuning in for this um, session. And uh, there it is, Paul's uh, <laughs> one colour background. <laughs> yeah, so basically, like, you know, to go with the whole principle about having a, having a colour background based on based on what you're keen on to, right? So like basically, if I've got something lighter and I'm keying with this really bad keyer onto this, then, then I get a silly, silly <laughs> halo around my head. <laughs> hence, the, hence, hence me running off to the art department to get a blackboard so that I can do this with a little bit of a better key. It's still not good. Yeah. It's still not IBK. <laughs> I love it. I think that's a great to get to notes. It's still going still to get notes here. <laughs> Always working, always working. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Brian, Tristan you. and Robin and the team at Deneg. And thanks everyone for Thank tuning you. in. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, thanks guys. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks all. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Cheers.